Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on the Gallic Wars. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to see what happens during Caesar's proconsulship in Gaul. He's supposed to stay in one place. I'll give you a hint, he does not. So, we are going to go ahead and start by setting the scene, figure out how we got to this point. Uh, then Caesar is going to cross the Alps, much like Hannibal 200 years earlier, um, and then into uh, kind of these new lands, not just Gaul, but Germany and Britain and beyond. Then we'll see the final siege uh, of the site of Elysia in central Gaul and the defeat of Vercingetorix by Julius Caesar. So it all begins even before the city of Rome, where for hundreds of years there was a huge diversity of tribes throughout the Italian peninsula. The kind of most sophisticated and the strongest were, of course, the Etruscans. And they were much stronger when the city of, than when the city of Rome was founded in 753 BC by Romulus. And for 250 years, a series of seven kings ruled the city of Rome. And those at the beginning, Romulus and Numa, they were good guys. And by the end, Tarquin the Proud, they were not good guys. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And as a result, we see one of the Republic's first heroes, Lucius Junius Brutus, throw Tarquin the Proud out of the city of Rome and institute a new form of government, which they and we call Roman Republicanism. And the guiding ideology of Roman, Republic Re Roman Republicanism is that there must never be another king in Rome, right? That's the ideology. Even at the highest level of political office, two people rule at any given time in that consulship, which is the kind of highest political position in Roman Republican government. Now, after Rome takes over the peninsula of Italy over the first 250 years of the Republic, and then moves on to uh, Sicily and North Africa and Spain and Greece and Asia during the next 130 years, after all that expansion, we start to see a new type of leader. And we see that these leaders no longer rely just on the kind of senatorial oligarchy, but instead, we call these guys the populares because they rely on the people themselves. And so the Gracchi are the kind of earliest um, iteration of this. And what Tiberius Gracchus does is he proposes this land reform bill that would take land away from the very, very wealthy, give it to regular people. And when he proposes that legislation, he doesn't even take it to the Senate. He takes it straight to the people, which while not illegal, was very strange in the ancient Roman world. And one of the questions we have with these guys, right, is what's the end goal? Are these guys heroes of the people, right? All their legislation seems to say yes. Or are they really just trying to come up with a new way to gain prestige and become the most powerful people in Rome? And there are some things that also suggest that, right? So Tiberius gets the other tribune kicked out of office, right? And so we have this kind of debate with ourselves about whether uh, these guys are kind of heroes of the people or whether they, like Marius and Sulla and all these other guys, are really just trying to get as powerful and prestigious as possible. Now, the next kind of set of leaders, we have Gaius Marius, the hero of the Populares, and Lucius Cornelius Sulla, the leader of the Optimates. And so they, they kind of embody these two different ways of doing politics. The Populares are all about appealing to the people giving them things that the people would want, all right? And in turn, the people will go ahead and support uh, the, the leader, all right? Sulla and the Optimates, they go ahead and do things by relying on those traditional forms of uh, oligarchic control, all right? So alliances with other elites, clients who rely on them for material and kind of monetary goods, that sort of thing. And what we see with these guys is the isolated um, events of of violence that occurred during the Gracchi's kind of time in power, where we see both of them killed, it all of a sudden erupts into all-out civil war. Sulla marches on the city of Rome. The following year, Marius takes his army and march on this, marches on the city of Rome. And then Sulla, after uh, his defeat of Mithridates, marches back on the city of Rome, and 50,000 people die in a Rome versus Rome all-out civil war. Now, Next up, we see Pompey with his kind of military victories, and we see Crassus getting filthy rich, and those are kind of the next iteration of leaders uh, of the Republic. And what we see with them is they start out pro-Sullen, right? They start out kind of in line with the Optimates, but during their time in power, they shift over to the Populares side of things. 
And during this time, we see the slow rise of a young man named Julius Caesar. And eventually, the three of these guys kind of team up uh, to become the leading, kind of most important people in the city of Rome. Now, after Caesar's consulship, in which he makes all senatorial debate public, he gets land for Pompey's veterans, and he gets good tax laws for Crassus' wealth, Caesar's, Caesar's awarded this proconsulship uh, in the province of Gaul. And so he's got a couple different areas where he's actually got power. One is Cisalpine Gaul, and what we mean by that is Gaul this side of the Alps, the Italian side of the Alps. He also gets Gaul, uh, Gallia Narbonensis, all right? And this is kind of Gaul around the city of Narbo, all right? So basically think of the French Riviera. And then finally, he's got Illyricum, which is kind of just over into modern day Croatia. So let's see what happens when Caesar leaves Cisalpine Gaul and heads across the Alps. So one of the coolest things here as we talk about the Gallic Wars is that we've got Caesar's firsthand account of what was going on, right? Think about that. It's like if George Washington had written down every little thing he was thinking while he fought the Revolutionary War, right? Um, so we've got Caesar's account, uh, we call it De Bello Gallico in Latin, right, concerning the, the Gallic War or about the Gallic War. And the very famous first lines of that is Gallia est omnis divisa in partes tres, which translates as all Gaul is divided into three parts. All right, and so he looks at this kind of center part, he looks at the bell guy up here, he looks at uh, the Aquitani down here, and um, that's kind of Gaul the way it is when he arrives. Now, the way that proconsulships work, all right, is you're given power in a very particular area. So Caesar has Cisalpine Gaul over here, right, Gaul this side of the Alps, and he's also got Gallia Narbonensis right here, and Caesar's allowed to have his army in those regions. Now, it wouldn't make for a very interesting story if Caesar just kept his army in those regions, and of course he does not. So in 58 BC, Caesar takes his army and he heads across the Alps into what we call Transalpine Gaul, right? Gaul on the other side of the, the Alps, Gaul across the Alps. Now, when we keep talking about Gaul, right, we're talking about modern day France, but it's worthwhile asking, who are the Gauls? Well, there's no single answer. Gaul is a lot of different tribes. So if you look at this map, these are all different tribes. The Arverni are different than the Haidui, which are different than the Sequani and the Helveti and the Lingones. All right? These are all different groups. Um, we also have a very long-term relationship between Gaul and Rome, and it's actually the Gauls, kind of from northern Italy, who were the last group of people to sack the city, and they did so in 390 BCE. Now, Gaul holds a lot of potential, though. They've been trading with Rome for a very long period of time, right? It's not just an adversarial relationship. And there's a series of rivers through there that make this trade very advantageous. Moreover, there are quite a few kind of natural resources that Rome would really like to get their hands on. So, in 58 BC, this is when Caesar crosses the Alps from Cisalpine Gaul into Transalpine Gaul and starts fighting uh, the Gallic people. Now, he's not technically allowed to do this. What he ends up saying is that there's a group of people, there's this kind of German group of people off the map over there, right, that end up pushing the Helvetii, one of the Gallic tribes, kind of westward. And as a result, the Helvetii end up pushing in to Gallia Narbonensis. So basically what he's saying is that there's a chain, uh, kind of a chain of events that leads to these Gauls bumping into Roman territory. And so he needs to go over there to put an end to this so that the Romans are, are not impacted. And so in 58 BC, he fights the Helvetii tribe. And at the Battle of Bibracte in that year, something like 200,000 Gauls end up dead, all right? So all these Gauls are moving down and there's like women and children as well as fighting men and, and that sort of thing. And Caesar just like massacres the lot of them. And so from the beginning, we get hundreds of thousands of Gauls uh, being killed. So Caesar has crossed the Alps, he's into the center of Gaul, and the, uh, the kind of later that year, he ends up going eastward to fight the Germans that started this whole chain of events. And so in 58 BC, Caesar ends up fighting Ariovistus and the Germans, who were the ones who pushed uh, the kind of Helvetii into Roman territory in the first place. 
And once again, Caesar is able to win a resounding victory. Okay. So, so far Caesar's crossed the Alps into the center of Gaul, then he's moved eastward into this kind of German territory over here, and now he's moving northwards towards the Belgae. In the following year, in 57 BC, Caesar starts fighting with the Belgae, and once again, just to give you a sense of what's going on, right, this is Gallia Narbonensis, this is where Caesar's allowed to be, this is what he says was being impacted very early on in 58, why he needed to fight, and now all of a sudden, he's hundreds of miles away on the other side of the country. So, the Belgae are known as these incredibly kind of fierce warriors. But just like the kind of rest of the Celts, even within the Belgae, there are lots of different little tribes. And what Caesar's able to do is win this kind of initial victory, and that like, uh, splinters the tribes even more, and then afterwards he's able to pick them off one by one. And in a way, this is kind of the, the whole story right, in a microcosm of Caesar's kind of movements through Gaul. He's able to fracture the different kind of tribes and then pick off the tribes one by one. So at this point in time, Caesar starts heading into new lands. In Rome, what we see is the triumvirate holding, all right? So, so far, we're in the middle of the 50s BC and uh, the triumvirate's holding strong. So Pompey and Crassus are consuls in the city of Rome. And then after that, Pompey is going to head out to Spain with his armies. And Crassus is going to head out to Syria, seeking that military victory that thus far has avoided him. Now what Caesar's got to do before he gets to those new, new lands, he's going to head out west towards the Veneti way out here. And there are these kind of renowned sailors, and he's got to put down a revolt. And following that, he starts getting kind of word of problems going on in this region of Germania, right? Modern day Germany. Now Caesar likes this, okay? This is like great for Caesar that there's problems going on here, and it's great for him because no Roman general has ever crossed the Rhine River. And so he's got this opportunity because these guys are causing some problems. He's got the opportunity to be the first Roman general ever to cross the Rhine. And so what he does, he builds this enormous bridge. And this is a magical like, feat of, of Roman engineering here. The river is something like 300 feet wide, and it's something like 30 feet deep. And moreover, it's got to be able to support like 40,000 Roman troops. And Caesar is able to get his troops to build this bridge in something like 10 days. Right? It's an absolutely kind of mind-boggling uh, feat of engineering. And so after this is built, Caesar marches his troops across the bridge and for 18 days chases the Germans around. And he wins a couple small little battles, right? And he gets them to sign some sort of treaty. And there's no real lasting impact, but it's enough to say, right, for him to say that he had um, a, uh, a victory over the Germans. And then he crosses back over the bridge to be done with them. And so one of the things that we kind of see here, right, is Caesar's starting to like, he likes this idea of being the first to do things. And after crossing into Germany, he then goes ahead and crosses the English Channel. So, what we see is he actually has two different invasions of the island of Britain. And once again, Caesar is the first Roman general to cross the English Channel into this, or onto this island. And the idea here is he's not going to stick around too long here either. We get the sense that he actually likes being the first to do something more than actually making any kind of lasting impact on it. And so Britain itself isn't actually brought into the Roman Empire until hundreds of years, or about a hundred years later. Um, but at the time, uh, Caesar's the first to go over there. Now, in his first kind of um, expedition into Britain, it's a disaster. His people are getting killed. The ships weren't docked perfectly. Uh, you can see them trying to fight their way onto land, and the, uh, the Britons just crushing them. Now, Caesar's second invasion of Britain is really something to behold. He takes something like 800 ships and 25,000 troops and lands on the shores of Britain. And he stays a lot longer than he does the first time, chasing around the Britons, winning some victories, and eventually getting them to sign some sort of treaty saying that the Romans basically beat them. Now, again, this doesn't have any real lasting impact. Britain's not brought into the Roman Empire for another 100 years, but it's enough to let Caesar say that he's the first Roman to defeat the Britons. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at the, the kind of final siege. Before we get there, let's take a look back in Rome. When we last looked, things were going strong with the triumvirate. Pompey and Crassus were consuls and then heading out to Spain and Syria, respectively. And now we see uh, uh, Crassus out in Syria, but we see things starting to erode with Pompey. All right. So Pompey's wife, Julia, the daughter of Julius Caesar, uh, she dies. All right. And Caesar offers Pompey kind of a, like a, a niece, basically, as a, a replacement. And Pompey's not really interested. We see him kind of the, the inklings of him starting to turn on Julius Caesar. Now, Crassus, on the other hand, doesn't have any opportunity to turn on Julius Caesar because he's stuck way out here in the east in the region of Parthia. All right. So again, he wants this military victory that he's never really been able to have. He's gotten as rich as he can possibly be, but he doesn't have the glory of those other kind of um, Roman generals. So uh, he ends up getting embroiled with the Parthians, the kind of strongest group just to the east of the Romans at this time. And this is a terrible idea. It's a botched job from the beginning. He gets kind of fooled by a couple different informants. He should never be in the battle to begin with. And uh, then he runs into these cataphracts, which are essentially the Parthian version of very heavily armored cavalry. Now, here at the Battle of Cari in 53 BC, we see Crassus get his entire Roman legion there totally destroyed. It gets so bad that Crassus himself is captured and beheaded, all right? And this very rarely occurs. Usually these generals are kind of back behind the lines, and even if they lose, the general retreats. As you can see in this battle, they have encircled Crassus, the entire Roman army, and they go ahead and collapse in, kill the, uh, the Roman legionnaires, and kill Crassus himself. And it gets so bad that he actually loses what we call the Roman standards, right? So the kind of symbol of Rome that walks before the army, that's a symbol of Rome's power and might. And Crassus loses these to the Parthian army. And one of the things we're going to see is that when Augustus takes over as first emperor about 50 years later, one of the first things he does is he goes and gets these standards back from the Parthians. Now, this is problematic because with Crassus's death, we lose the kind of mediator between Caesar and Pompey, all right? So Crassus had kind of been the guy who uh, softens the blows between those two guys. And we've seen that Pompey's wife, Julia, the daughter of Julius Caesar, has recently died. And now Pompey starts kind of putting forth this legislation that goes against Julius Caesar. So the first thing that we see is a rule that says you have to be present in the city of Rome if you want to run for office, okay? And that's going to be problematic because Julius Caesar's way up in Gaul, and that means if he wants kind of to, uh, to be in office, he's got to go back uh, to Rome. The second thing that we see is that we see these kind of retroactive laws passed, one against bribery, and Julius Caesar was definitely bribing people, and then one against uh, kind of having a certain number of years between the consulship and then taking over an army for your proconsulship. And both of these are aimed at trying to kind of make sure that Julius Caesar has officially done something against the law. So at this point in time, uh, Julius Caesar and Pompey's relationship has, has basically totally fractured, right? Pompey has be gone back over to the side of the Optimates, back over to the side of the rest of the Senate, and Julius Caesar is still running around Gaul. After Britain, he ends up heading south to the site of Elysium. And over the next two years, in 53 and 52 BC, he ends up fighting a series of battles against the Gallic kind of confederation. All right? Now again, one of the huge problems the Gauls have had is that they're all these kind of independent little tribes. All right? And so they fight as much with each other as they do with Rome. And up to this point, they haven't been able to put together a cohesive kind of um, fighting unit that combines all these different tribes and fights against Rome. And it's not until this guy, Vercingetorix, of the, uh, the Arverni, that they're able to do that. And so he starts rallying all these tribes together, basically saying, if we don't do this, right, we're all done for. And he gets those tribes together with tens of thousands, over 100,000 troops at the site of Elysia 
in, in modern-day central France or in central Gaul. Now, what Caesar does is he once again puts forth one of these kind of amazing engineering feats. Rather than try to besiege the city and sack the walls, he builds his own wall around the city of Elysia. And so you can see on the inside, right, it's got these pits with spikes, these spikes sticking out to prevent a cavalry invasion. And then we've got this little dip and moat and then a, a hill on the other side before we get the wall itself. So it's something like 10 miles of walls going all the way around the city. And you might be thinking, like, why is he doing that, right? Well, the goal here is to basically starve the people on the interior. If they can't get any food and they can't get out, things are not going to go well for the people in the city. And that starts working pretty well. But somehow, at some point in time, some messenger is able to get out beyond the walls and start going to get reinforcements. And what we end up seeing is that hundreds of thousands, right, something like 250,000 Gallic reinforcements are able to be gathered and start coming in from the outside. And so now Caesar is totally unprotected. And so what does he do? Builds another wall, all right? This is known as the, uh, the double circumvallation, right? So the first wall on the interior, then he builds an even longer wall, right, on the exterior, and now Caesar's troops are kind of trapped in the middle. And what ends up happening is after this kind of standoff, right, the Gauls on the outside and the Gauls on the inside and Caesar in the middle, eventually Caesar with his cavalry break forward towards the interior and they're able to kind of slaughter a bunch of the troops on the interior who have been basically rotting from hunger and disease, right? Disease is running rampant in the city, everybody's starving, so they're able to do that. Roman cavalry support from the outside and then they bust out and they're able to defeat the Gauls at Elysia. Now, the leader of those Gauls, Vercingetorix, he goes up and submits his surrender to Caesar. And for like the next five years, he's sent off to Rome, and he basically rots in a prison in Rome, waiting for Caesar to come back and uh, celebrate his triumph for his victory over the Gauls. So, a few concluding thoughts. Once again, we can look at Caesar in a couple different ways. On the one hand, He's one of the kind of greatest military technicians that the Roman world ever saw, right? He's able to win an enormous number of victories, not just militarily, but also by these kind of very impressive engineering feats. On the other hand, uh, he wrought kind of incredible destruction amongst the Gallic people. So somewhere along the lines of uh, something about a million Gauls died during Caesar's kind of wars. And something like a million more were enslaved during that same period of time. In the best case scenario, right, that affected, that was about a third of the population of Gaul. Right? Imagine a war today that wipes out 100 million Americans, right, a third of our population. And in the worst case scenario, there were only about a third of the population left. So somewhere in between a third being killed or two thirds being killed and enslaved. So, on the one hand, right, Caesar's one of the most kind of accomplished generals ever. On the other hand, right, people refer to him as basically being the leader of a, uh, a genocide. And that kind of determination, right, is left up to you, the viewer and the listener and the historian, as we look at the Gallic Wars. <laughs>